good to see you this morning in worship. We have a few announcements before we get started. We had a great day yesterday with the Presbyterian Women's Bazaar, and they at least equaled last year. I'll, I'll save for them to tell you the amount, but uh, it's not over. If you need jams or jellies or handcrafts in the Family Life Center and on the patio where we fellowship, there are a few things that I encourage you to take a look at. Um, it's a great time to get gifts for family or for yourself. A um, couple other announcements. Uh, we have two, in two weeks, uh, Sunday, October 30th, there'll be one service at 9.30 here in the sanctuary because it's a fifth Sunday, remember? And then we will go down to the Family Life Center afterwards for Know Your Deacon and Elder Day. So we'll have some fellowship. We'll get to know our deacons and elders. Also, the week after that, I think Rose has an announcement for us. Yeah, got a microphone there? Good. Good morning. On uh, November 6th, Sunday, November 6th, is Pledge Dedication Sunday. And also was requested to be a potluck lunch, potluck Sunday, chicken potluck lunch on that Sunday also. Chicken Pie Shop is still open and still in business. I was thrilled to find that out. The cost this year is going to be $7 because of, with everything else they've gone up with them also. And I will take names today and you can pay me later because I'm not set up for that. Or you can just uh, give me your name and pay next week for the next two Sundays. But I just wanted to make you aware to mark, your, mark the date, November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. So we have a lot going on. Dedication Sunday is November 6th. Sue? No. We'll call you. There are a lot of announcements. Sue can't wait. Um, but uh, we will have Bible study this Tuesday at 1 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And please notice the beautiful flowers given by Joan Stroh and um, Sue Wright. So... I encourage you to take a breath, come and let us worship the Lord together. stand with me as we are called into worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We shout with the joy to the rock of our salvation. Come on, let us the Lord. And we'll do that in our opening song, which is uh, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
Friends, as we gather our thoughts into quietness, let us confess our sins to the one who knows us best. Gracious God, our judge and our redeemer, we confess that we worship things rather than you. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We ask that you forgive us our sins and free us from selfishness. Now, our personal confessions in the quiet of this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And here is the assurance of pardon. While we were yet far away, Christ died to bring us home. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We give thanks for this good news and turn in hope to a new day, walking with the Lord who saved us. giving and so we need to increase our pledges as well so pray this week I'm going to give increase my pledge 10% see if you can do the same okay thank you And now, as we continue in worship to our Lord by presenting our tithes and offerings, which is really, which are really His. So, ushers, please come forward.
we praise you. Offer you from the blessing given us that it would be reproduced and shared around the world. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please stand uh, with, for the song of preparation on page four words of Lord of All Good. Oh my gosh. Let's see, I skipped, I skipped the part. We can pray all the time. We can pray any time. Well, we can only sing some of the time. So let's pray first and then we'll sing. Lord God, you have appointed us to be your witnesses, to be light that shines in the world. Let us not hide the bright hope you have given us, but to tell everyone your love revealed in Jesus Christ the Lord. We think of people that you have put in our minds and on our hearts, and even as we tie quilts and pray for them, show us how we can reach out to them and fill their emptiness. Almighty God, your son Jesus healed the sick and restored them to wholeness of life. Look with compassion on the anguish of those who are suffering, and by your power make whole all peoples and all nations. We consider those who are challenged in getting homes, but also people behind whose doors their homes are fractured or divided. We remember also people who are getting treatments and people who are hungry, people who are worried about making the next payments or getting a job. And we remember those who deal every day with addictions of one sort or another. Help us to look to you to be our joy and to fill our souls and hearts that we would not look to other things of this world. Lord God, we lift up the children, the children of our preschool, our preschool teachers, our preschool families, but also the neighborhoods in Chula Vista. Help us to learn new ways to speak the language of parents, to encourage them, and to be there for them, not only in our own families and generations, but all around. We remember the teachers, the first responders, the police, those who protect us at every level, even out in the world. Sometimes it's hard to remember that you are still in control, that other voices and noises tell us to worry and be afraid. But we ask that you freshen in us that awareness that you always provide and that you are leading us ever forward in the knowledge of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as you challenge the powers that rule the world, we ask that you show favor to the oppressed and still in us a sense of true justice that we would discern and follow the signs to your kingdom. And we pray this as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we have prepared our hearts towards the world, we ask that we together sing number 375, Lord of all good, to prepare our hearts to praise the Lord.
The New Testament lesson today is taken from Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. And on most of the Bibles, that would be on page 199. A few of the Bibles are uh, a couple of pages different. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Now that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul's uh, encouragement, we are turning to the Old Testament, and we will look at this story in the book of 1 Kings in light of what Paul has written. Um, <clears throat> I notice we don't have the page numbers, but I will tell you 1 Kings is at the end of the histories. It's about a quarter of the way in in your Bible, and it comes after 1 and 2 Samuel and before 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles. So if you can get in that range, you're looking, sorry, for 2 Kings chapter 4. And I'm reading beginning at the first. One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children, my two sons, as his slaves. And Elisha asked her, What can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house at all except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. Do not get just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into each of these containers. Set the full ones on one side. And so the woman left. And after she had shut the door behind her, and her sons, her they, the sons, kept bringing her containers, jars, to keep on pouring. And when each jar was full, she finally said to her son, bring me another jar. And he replied, there aren't any more. And the oil stopped. Then the widow went and told the man of God, that is Elisha, and he said, go now and sell the oil to pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. This is God's word for us today. We're grateful for it. Well, I don't know if you're like me, but I love to go to Costco, and it's a little overwhelming, but I know my way around. And recently, I had occasion to go into a real grocery store, and I could not find my way around. The aisles had gotten as tall as Costco, and the choices were overwhelming. There's not just one or two peanut butters, there's a whole section of peanut butter. And it went on and on, and I thought to myself, why am I lost? Why am I complaining? This is a first world problem. Maybe you've heard that from your family. I know the younger generation likes to talk about third world problems being famine, suffering, hunger, disease. And first world problems being they can't have their avocado toast in the morning. And yet that does kind of underline how blessed we are in this country. We have so much. And yet we also know what it is like to be in need. For all of us are human and we may suffer illness or loss. We may have griefs and sorrows. And we may experience job difficulties. In this economy, we're all worried about what will happen in the next few months. But these verses are important to remind us 
that first world or third world. Everyone has the greatest need of all, and God is the provider for all of our needs. We must turn to God. Well, it can be a challenge for us sometimes to see how that works, and this story is a story of a woman who was the widow of a prophet. The Jewish people think it was Obadiah who was who worked alongside Elijah, we talked about a month ago, uh, against the Queen Jezebel. But we're, even in that case, there was a company of prophets, and they would go around Israel and call people to faithfulness, to trust in God, even though the Queen Jezebel was against them, and they were greatly persecuted. Well, this prophet died, and he left a young mother and two sons and great debt. They did not know how to meet their own debt. And so there was only one way to make it up and that was to sell the sons. Creditors would actually come and take the sons and have them work off the debt. And that would happen maybe much of their life. The widow would then have an uncertain future. She would have lost everything. She would have lost her sons and she would have no income of her own to look forward to. And I'd like to point out that this is an ongoing story in the Bible that we care for the widows, that we care for the orphans or the sons, that no one be this left out and this empty, this downtrodden. The word the Bible uses is famine because certainly there was a hunger that was deeper than food. So even as this woman was trying to get by in a time of great short supply and short famine. She had not much left to give. It was true need. And so, in her difficulty, she cried out to God through Elisha, the prophet. And Elisha had been taught directly by Elijah and had taken his mantle. Elisha had become the... Uh, the trainee and now the person who took over the ministry of Elijah and was expected to do great miracles. And this chapter has five miracles of Elisha. This is the first, though not the greatest. And what I love about this chapter is it has echoes, or actually foreshadowing, of Jesus' ministry as he walked around Galilee, performing individual miracles for people who were in times of great need. So the widow cries out to God through Elisha, her husband's co-worker. And she names her fears right out. She doesn't complain to her neighbors. She doesn't try and guilt the community service center to give her more time. She doesn't even worry about the creditors. She goes right to the source of all of her care, right to Elisha. And it is there that Elisha gives her encouragement he doesn't discount her. He doesn't put her in her place, which would be the appropriate thing for a man of God to a woman now single. But he listens to her, and he puts words to her worries, and he says, tell me, what can I do for you? He doesn't assume. He wants to hear in her own words, what is her need? And as she tells him, then he says, famine, Okay, tell me, what do you have in the house? Another way of saying that is, you have suffered greatly, but what do you have left? Give me something to work with. I love that. And she, who is suffering greatly, she says, all I have is a single jar of oil. And you know, it's like that. So often we make a long list of what we're missing, but in that list, we miss what we've already had. It's like the saying that when it is dark enough, you can finally see the stars. We need to look for what we have left, for that is where the miracle comes from. And when the clutter is taken away, the wonder of what God will do will help us. So Elisha hears that she has just one jar of oil, and he says, this is our resource. You're right, it's not enough. So, you need to go to all the neighbors, all the townspeople, borrow their empty jars, borrow them, and bring them home to your house. That's an odd description. 
She's not asking for food or, or for money or more oil. She's just asking for what the neighbors are not able to use. But interestingly enough, it's very clear that he wants her to find the place of other people's famine. He sends her out door to door to find other people's emptiness. Because it costs nothing to give that away. And she can literally borrow it. And it will become the base of the miracle for her. She receives those containers that are not being used. And her sons begin to catch on. And they go in more places. They get more and more and bring them home. And then, as Elisha had told her, they lock the door behind them. That is to be, this is for them to see. This is not a spectacle for attention. It's not a circus. This is their private moment of worship between them and God, where God will multiply for them to serve others. And so this precious commodity, this oil that she has in one jar that's barely enough to even light a candle is going to be used to light everyone's candles everywhere. But it's interesting, instead of waiting for more bad things to happen, they work together one jar at a time as she pours the oil from her small jar into the first container. And it fills up. And then another one. And it fills up. And the sons begin to catch on, and they're running to get the containers. Get a bigger one. Get a better one. Get the one from the neighbor across the street. One by one, they pour the oil from the small jar into each of the other jars. It's kind of like if you imagine starter dough for sourdough. It grows. It is a miracle, don't doubt it. But it is a unique miracle where there is more and more as long as they are pouring. And finally, when every jar is full, the one woman tells her son to bring another jar, and he says, there aren't any more. And sure enough, when they stop pouring, the jar stops filling. Isn't it amazing that there is always just enough? And it's not overflowing, but neither is it stopping until they stop. It's kind of like that with us. As long as we're serving, God gives us energy to serve. As long as we're pouring, God will use us to pour for others. And so, the woman realizes they have a great miracle and a whole store of oil. She goes back to Elisha obediently. She doesn't presume. She says, what next? And Elisha tells her, Use what is extra to sell to pay your debts. That was what she came to him for, immediate need, first need. And he heard her well and asked her to sell that oil to solve the problem. I love that. But what is also amazing is that God provides for the widow because if she sells the oil to pay off her debts, she is basically being set up in a business. Yes, Elisha is her venture capitalist. And she will now be the town oil, oil uh, merchant. And people will go there. And they will get it from her. And they will also get their own jars back. Nothing is wasted in God's economy. She is cared for. The sons remain home. The community is blessed with this one very personal miracle. Well, so often we hold on too tight to what we have. We're afraid we're going to run out or it won't last. Our efforts are temporary and we're afraid we'll be empty. We'll have famine. But the promise here is that we will have feast if we trust God. Things don't last. They don't hold over. But God provides. And God gives us more than material wealth. He gives us new and surprising answers to our questions. Just enough. And to fill us with wonder. Our own personal famine can lead us to God's feast. We know what we have. We add what others aren't using. And God multiplies that. 
Notice this miracle, like the miracle of the loaves and fishes, involves a very small offering from an unlikely source. And God uses that. So often when we are in a feast, we don't ask God how we can offer more. So often when we are well off, we forget to care for those who are in need. But once we have stood in that place and experienced that hunger, that is when we remember and always go back to care for others. There's a, a young girl, 12 years old, 10 years ago, um, in Orange County. She had a brain tumor. She heard this story. She realized that she didn't have much. Her uh, prognosis wasn't good, but when she went to get treatment, she saw other kids suffering as well. And they had no toys. So she went to her church and she said, let's take jars and fill them with toys for the kids getting chemo. Sorry. She began a ministry called Joy Jars. 10 years later, she has filled over a half million Joy Jars. And Jessie Reese is long gone to her eternal home. But her ministry continues. Just this last week in Washington, D.C., there was a big event where over 3,000 joy jars were filled by 12-year-old children with toys for others who were in need. And the joy isn't that they had cancer. No, that was the famine. But the feast is that they were able to share together. And while they were in their treatments, they would be surprised by a new type of entertainment or toy, and it would distract them as they suffered. As I said, this story was the inspiration for Jesse Joy Reese. And it is about God's generosity. It is about our giving. But I want us to think more deeply than that, because that's momentary. We need to look at what lasts. You see, Jesse's middle name was Joy. And for her, it was about never giving up and always claiming the joy of the Lord. She trusted that God would provide for her and for others. And she stubbornly refused to give up, even as she suffered. She did not give up her fight, and she would not give up her joy. And so she created it in others. These are tough situations. I wish they had a different outcome, but this life is temporary, and our jars will find themselves short. And we will wonder if the creditor is at the gate, or if our suffering is at the door. But I would say we need more joy, because this world is greatly troubled by emptiness. Our issues may be minor compared to others, and yet we continue to see others try to find their satisfaction in fame or glory, like football, or money, or famous marriages that soon fall apart, or royal families that are just like ours, struggling with wayward children and fights between siblings. Life is hard, and as humans, we do get caught up in some of the things that sap us of our joy. And when they do, they leave us feeling empty, longing for something deeper and stronger. Like King Solomon said, all is vanity. There is no rescue from the struggle. And then that is the point we find ourselves with maybe only one precious jar of joy left. The joy that God will use to make a meal or a feast of companionship of friendship. God will use that jar of our joy to bring heat and light and introduce us to others as we share God's blessing. You know, C.S. Lewis said that if we consider the unblushing promises of reward in the world, it would seem that our Lord finds us not too strong, but too weak in our requests. We are half-hearted. 
God wants us to ask for more. There is great truth in that. We ask for things that come and go, but God wants us to give us the life that is abundant, that overflows. And God wants to keep on giving. Yet too often we have stopped pouring. We have stopped asking. And when God calls to us through our need, he offers us Christ, whose life was poured out, that we would live always with him. And then he sends us to our neighbors to find out where their emptiness is and to gather it up, to use it, to value it, to listen to it, and to pour joy into their empty containers. But we can't stop. We need to keep on pouring, for that is the miracle. It is good news. And this season, we are not only grateful for all that God has given for us, for his promise to care for us, but we are grateful for the call to share our imperfect lives with our imperfect neighbors and to give from our emptiness to fill others. This is God's gift to us as it was his gift to the whole world. Thanks be to God. Now let us stand and we will sing together number 538, Lord dismiss us with your blessing. Christ and he has saved us. Let's never forget that there are more people out there who are in great need of a Savior. And so let's joyfully give that they would know and come to know him better. Go in the knowledge of the good news, in the power of the Lord who cares for us, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as he guides and leads us into the future. Amen.